Thank you very much. Very pleased to be here. Thank you, Naomi, for the kind introduction. Um, what I'm going to do today is kind of, you know, now that we've been at this for a day and sort of getting some framework on things, this talk is really really focused on this the key question of how to explain violent extremism. And what I'm trying to get at is just some of the methodological context of even addressing that issue. So it's a bit general. Uh, and for those of you without a background, background in terrorism studies, it may even be a bit sort of abstract in the sense that you can't concretely know what I'm talking about. I'll try and illustrate some of the points. But I'm generally trying to get at, literally the title's quite accurate, that if you're going to study this issue, if, and if you're going to learn anything from the efforts over the last 20 years to look at violent extremism, there are certain really strong methodological issues and problems that keep propping up over and over again. And these issues, as I've partially say, are probably endemic. There's no easy solution to any of them. But the object is to try and work at ameliorating them. And the object is to try and raise people's consciousness of these issues. They're often in, when you're reading studies in terrorism or security studies or about violent extremism, these issues individually arise. Sometimes they are actually addressed in some articles, but rarely does the whole package get uh, addressed or considered. And I use the word matrix because really I want to stress that you have to cope with all of them. They all interact and influence each other. If you make advancements on one but fail to advance on another, there'll be problems. In a way, you have to be constantly aware of all of them, even if it doesn't mean you're always addressing all of them. So though there are probably other ones, but the ones that just through my years of reading in the field have come to my attention are these ones. The, the normative challenge, the primary data challenge, the heterogeneity problem, the complexity problem, and the problem of specificity. The, I may want to change the language on some of these, but it's enough for us to be able to grasp uh, what's going on here. Part of my argument as Naomi's introduction suggests, as I've written, of course, a lot about the absolute importance in studying religious uh, terrorism, jihadism in particular, to pay attention to what the jihadists themselves are saying, to appreciate that they're what we're calling here first-person accounts, are a really valuable source of information. Even though they may be distorted in certain ways, they're, they're regrettably discounted in a lot of the leading literature on religious terrorism. And I, I, I've advanced in various articles, arguments about this, about who's doing it, how they're doing it, and why it's inadequate that they're being discounted. I'll only indirectly dwell on that now. Really what I just want to stress is that if we hope to make progress on ameliorating these fundamental methodological issues, it's imperative that we pay attention to those first-person accounts. This is a really crude little diagram I just drew up to try and like a sort of vector diagram to sort of give a sense of how these issues are related, how they overlap. Some issues are like more pervasive, bigger, they, uh, you know, they encompass everything almost. Other issues are a little bit more, you know, limited in terms of uh, their relevance. And to some extent also there's a sense I find when I sort of think about these issues of sort of thinking in from the outside towards the middle, although I realized I organized them when I'm addressing them, not quite in that way. <laughs> but I might come back to this. And uh, I'm probably going to keep thinking about this and get the assistance of somebody who really knows how to do effective graphics to develop some kind of, some kind of better. That literally did like that two days before coming here. So. Okay, so the normative challenge. I do always myself, you don't have to start with any of these. You could start anywhere. It depends on you know, where it impacts the work or, or your, what you're thinking about. I find myself constantly thinking about the normative challenge and the normative issues as a kind of starting point. And I'm writing a book on religion and terrorism uh, for Cambridge University Press right now. And informing that writing that book, this is where my mind wanted to go to start with. So the introduction to the book dwells on these issues to some extent. So the key thing that I notice, and it's subtle, is that because terrorism is so beyond the pale of normal human behavior, 
it really poses problems for people, even very sophisticated scholars, and how they address it and deal with it. There's very hard to escape a kind of repugnance or a kind of desire to condemn something as you're actually studying it. And there's considerable, it's been, this has been written about by several other people, there's considerable fear among scholars that if they express too much sort of sympathy or empathy for the perspective of the terrorists, that somehow they'll then be accused of being an apologist for the terrorists, right? And that's, and that's not a light concern. I mean, it, it, nobody wants to be standing at a podium like this at a meeting and be accused of that, or worse, in a policy event where you're talking to government officials where they are very concerned about it. And most of our funding comes from governments. And the governments can easily and categorically operate from a condemning perspective. It's a bad thing. We're figuring out how to stop it, right? And they're reluctant often when you're talking to step outside of that normative framework. And it can cause quite a bit of uh, trouble in dealing with the phenomenon. And I, pressing that further, I do think terrorism as a phenomenon is fundamentally a moral phenomenon. Right? It's a moral phenomenon from the perspective of the terrorists. It's a moral phenomenon from the perspective of society coping with terrorism. And so you can't escape this normative moral context of all discussion of terrorism. But I'm speaking from the perspective of a social scientist. And I'm mainly thinking about social scientists studying terrorism. They're not used to dealing with moral dilemmas and moral language and moral issues. And of course, well, nobody believes it's a reality. I think on the whole, most social scientists still hold to notions of a value neutral approach in their work. They don't, you know, they don't entertain any illusions that you can be completely neutral in the way you approach something. There's no such thing as objectivity. But the way I like to put it is that I think most of us still hold to a regulatory ideal of arriving at a more neutral perspective. What value of our work is we're more neutral than, let's say, journalists or others approaching the same topic. Um, then that gets compounded by a number of things. It gets compounded by the fact that our key terms, like extreme, well, terrorism itself, radicalization, extremism, these terms themselves, as a lot of good analysis has shown, are inherently relativistic. They're contextually dependent. They're loaded with moral implications that are often not understood. So even the language you use is bringing along baggage all the time that sometimes is unpacked, often isn't. Um, and then in dealing with religious terrorism, it, this whole issue of the normative challenge ratchets up in ways that I've been talking about directly in my work more. <clears throat> because I don't want to make sweeping generalizations, but we're in a very sort of brief context here to talk about things. I've talked about there being a secular bias in the social scientific treatment of religious terrorism. And that's pretty natural because as lots of studies demonstrate, the most secular group of people, one of the most secular group of people walking around on this planet are social scientists. Uh, I involved, I was in a, a director, I was an external for a doctoral dissertation years ago tracking students through their undergraduate degrees and what he demonstrated is most of the students that go through nat natural science programs and engineering, their religiosity stays pretty much intact from the moment they arrive to the time they leave. Science doesn't turn them into atheists. It's the students who take sociology, psychology, anthropology, who maybe come in, come in religious and leave atheists, right? So social scientists just have a hard time grasping the significance and reality of religious motivations. And in fact, I think they experience a, a disdain. They express a disdain for religion uh, because they have a personal disdain for it. So naturally enough, we have this problem that they kind of mirror. I find religion to be an, an implausible, strange, antiquated, whatever language you want to use, motivation for people. So it must be true for others too. And if it's not true for others, then it must be because there's something blocking that or preventing that from happening. So there is this normative dissonance going on in for, uh, people studying uh, religious terrorism. And I'm being vague here. As some of you know, if you go into my articles, 
I've spelt it out carefully, taking leading scholars, looking at their work, breaking it down idea by idea, sentence by sentence, showing where this shows up and how it poses problems. I think there's also a larger problem, but I can't, this is just speculation, you can't document it. I think in the West in general, we have a problem because our societies, personally, we're secularized. Personally, we don't understand religion very well anymore, most of us. There's an element of disdain for it. Yet we live in societies where religion is still seen as a social good, publicly. And where actually, legally, it's protected. And we all recognize those constitutional protections for religious expression are key to the foundation of our whole societies, that historically and politically and otherwise, that's the base on which all of our other civil liberties rest. And so how do you, there is this tension, how do we be critical of religious terrorism and terrorists who claim to be religious, and yet also recognize that in our own society, if, if they were not terrorists and they were expressing these religious ideas, we'd feel uh, uh, some pressure to treat them far more favorably or sympathetically. Um, I'm probably not going to have enough time, but I was telling uh, Rick about this yesterday that I would display this little trick I use in class, right? And I think it might be worth doing. So, because I think it works quite well to display what's going. When I'm teaching uh, sociology of religion at university to an undergraduate level, and recognizing most of the students in the class are not religious, they're probably there out of curiosity. Oh, what's this thing religion about? Let's take a class on religion, right? I always. I go up to the front of the classroom, you know, you've got this, you're in a big lecture hall, you've got 20 feet of board in front of you. I just take the chalk, I can't walk away from the microphone to do this, right? So you'll have to visualize it. I just take a chalk and I draw a line all the way across the blackboards, a good 20, 30, 40 feet, whatever it is. And about an inch from the end, I draw a little sort of marker. And then say, you know, what is this? I say, Imagine the line to be human history, however you want to conceive of it, millennia or even just the last 12,000 years of civilization. That little inch over there represents the period of time in human history when people have even conceived that you could create a society that wasn't founded on religious principles. And then say, given that, and we live in that one inch, we have to recognize how exceptional our perspective is. In terms of most other people living in the world today, outside of the secularized West, but even more just in terms of surely there's a legacy that we have to recognize is encoded into the human way of understanding and dealing with its world, right? That comes out of this millennia of a religious orientation. Primary data problem is pretty straightforward. Actually, in the, the talk yesterday given, I'm, I'm afraid I can't remember the name of the scholar, but she was working with the Connect Project, dealing with radicalization in the Middle East, North Africa, and the Balkans. I was so pleased because at one point she started going on about the, the issue of primary data, the key aspect of primary data, the lack of primary data. And this is a pretty well-known one, right? We just lack when I say primary data, I'm really thinking in terms of interview data. So the, if you could literally go, you can go out there and document like on one page the number of articles that really involve good primary data, interview data with terrorists. I'm not talking as much data about people who are just supportive. I'm talking about active terrorists, right? So it's very, very limited over against the scale, scale, uh, scope and scale of the kind of analysis being offered. So, you know, why is that? Well, there's some obvious reasons, right? And I, I'm partly in my talk in Utrecht, I was being practical in a sense, and I want to be practical today too. Part of the problem is, that, of course, it's extremely hard to recruit such participants. Uh, access is extremely problematic. However, we have arrived at a situation now where I would tell you that often we now have the means to recruit those individuals. Right? There are more established networks that you can access than you would think is the case. However, if you do establish those networks and start those dialogues, lots of luck getting ethics clearance. Because we have a barrier. We have a problem with research ethics boards being extremely risk adverse in this context and blocking a lot of research. So I was just the external examiner on an MA thesis at Queen's University in uh, Kingston, Ontario.
a uh, very good thesis, but she tried for six months to get ethics clearance to be able to interview some far-right extremists that she already knew and had already been in dialogue with and was blocked and blocked and blocked. So her supervisor said, you, you're running out of time. You just have to write a thesis without it. And it's too bad because there's a very bright, capable student, clearly prepared on the sort of theoretical side, but no real data because she was blocked from acquiring data. I think there also is a question of failure of nerve, and I understand it because I was quite scared myself when I, when my background is talking to members of new religious movements, far less scary than terrorists, but still scary because to walk into a church of Scientology and sit down with them and have a conversation when you know everything they're doing is to convert you to their particular point of view and that they're going to track you in every way they can and continue to put pressure on you, you have to have the ability to say, I'm gonna, this, I'm gonna undergo this kind of additional research hardship in order to acquire valuable information. Then there's this problem of accounts, which I think is exaggerated. All I mean by that, accounts is a term used in sociology to talk about people's explanations of their behavior. And I'm gonna track back onto this a little later in the talk. Um, in the current literature dealing with interviewing terrorists, and primary data from terrorists, there is what I've called a hermeneutic of suspicion, excessively so. Clearly you have to exercise caution in accepting what a terrorist tells you about their motivations. But most of the literature adopts an attitude of almost totally dismissing or anything a terrorist says to immediately start looking for the subversive or other meaning of what they're saying, right? The, they may be saying one thing, that's the manifest thing they're saying, but what's the latent uh, process going on here. And uh, so there's a conditioning in the field, and I think it grows out of that normative dissonance to be overly uh, 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 skeptical of what terrorists are telling you. So again, I published an article in 2009 talking about taking terrorist accounts of their motivations seriously, and it's just preliminarily laying out again the inadequacy of the existing arguments about skepticism and the ways in which there's good literature elsewhere about how you can use this primary material to be careful about distortions but still acquire valuable pieces of information. Um, and lastly, I'm just going to comment, out of a, out of a you know, response to all these problems, it's great. It's what's happened. We did it as well. Everybody's gone online. right? It's easier to access extremists in an online context. All the issues I'm talking about are resolved a bit when you go into an online context. And we have mountains of literature coming out now every single month in the journals based on online materials. And again, just so you put it in a little context, uh, along with two of my students, I published the very first article ever on religion online in 1999. And then we published a book, Religion Online, in 2004, right? And so. Early on, we really got into this whole issue of you know, online research, et cetera. I don't do that anymore. But the caution I wanted to raise is that what you acquire online, yes, is informative, is helpful. It does have symmetry with what happens not online in the so-called real world or offline. But there are differences too, as we all know. People are one thing online and another thing offline. And the most obvious one in terms of terrorism research is there will be a lot of radical talk online, but the person's life may not reflect much of that radical talk online. So if the only source of your data is all transcripts of all that radical chat, you're not really getting a very accurate picture of really what's happening. And we've, we're kind of losing track of that a bit in the glut of research dealing with online materials. Heterogeneity problem, this is, comes up in so many different ways. I forgot to bring my little notes up here because I had to help me break this down because there's so many forms of heterogeneity. Basically, this is this, and this is a tough one for people coming from outside the field. Most people inside the field are aware of it. And that is just simply that there are so many different types of terrorism. That's obvious. I mean, you have everything from left and right to religious, et cetera. Then you have sub-variants. So if you take religious terrorism, well, um Shinrikyo, new religious movement religious terrorism, is different from jihadism, as different as night and day, and yet share commonalities too, right? And then there's even further sub-variants you can work out. But then you have the differences on 
the uh, context of the group, historically, geographically, the size, the organizational structure of the group, differences in leadership, uh, actual leaders and styles of leadership and leadership structures within the groups. Um, you have differences in roles in the group. So you can't, as we, you know, John Horgan's a good one for early on stressing this. What you learn about a front line, like the guy who's actually going to plant the bomb is not the same as the guy who's just out recruiting funds for the group, right? They may be different types of people involved for different reasons, uh, different conceptions and justifications for their actions, etc. And there'll be commonality again, but the differences matter. There's also, as Petter Nesser and others have effectively developed in their research, we can actually create typologies of the different kinds of people who become involved. So uh, there's the obvious old differences between leadership and inner circle and followers, but also between like sort of drifters that fall into the situation versus people who are uh, entrepreneurs, who are active, you know, powerful creators of terrorist cells and movements. So this one's pretty straightforward. It's just that we have to keep aware of this. Um, I think to do that, often what we need to do is work more with teams. Oh, I know the other context I was going to bring in from my little notes. Where I first became aware of this is I started working with the Toronto 18 group, right? Which some of you, anyone know the Toronto 18? No? Okay. So Toronto 18 is the single largest terrorism case in Canada, and it was in 2006, and at that time it was really one of the largest terrorism plots you know, uncovered in the world. So in the end, it's called the Toronto 18, in the end 11 individuals were convicted because many were minors, and as a result they didn't get convicted. So 11 individuals were convicted of planning to set off two bombs in downtown Toronto that if they had succeeded would have been as destructive as the Oklahoma uh, bombing of Timothy LaVey. So they would have caused massive destruction. They also had a lot of other crazy schemes to kidnap the prime minister and cut his head off and you know, typical stuff like this. But that trial went on for a long time, caused a huge sensation in, in Canada. So we studied it. We've interviewed uh, three of the members of the Toronto 18. And at the time, so it's, that's a long time ago, it's 2006 through to when the trials happened in 2009, 2010, even the academic literature was drawing conclusions from Palestinian suicide bombers and applying it to these young kids who grew up in suburban Toronto. So that's just the, you're going to get misattributions if you think that somebody in the conflict zone of Palestine has anything to do with a kid growing up in the peaceful Scarborough neighborhood of Toronto. So we need to be aware of this heterogeneity. I think this can be done through teamwork. Teamwork is very difficult, though. That's the practical issues, as we're, ex we're experiencing here in the overall, and as Rick's project overall is demonstrating. Complexity is what I dealt with in the talk in Utrecht. Uh, so I'm not going to dwell on it too much. I mean, it's just, we, but this is a growing and growing issue. Uh, the better and better our research gets, especially the really sophisticated quantitative analysis done with, uh, with uh, data sets that have been uh, purposefully created for research, so data sets of lone actor terrorists, data sets of specific types of groups, et cetera, you know, we're discovering that this is an enormously complex set of factors that in determining any single person's radicalization, there are probably many, many variables involved interacting in complex ways. And in, as that old adage goes, no two people radicalize in the same way. There is pattern. There is commonality. Just like there is, I always use this analogy from teaching sociology, um, no two young people become prostitutes in the same way. But we do know that there are very strong factors that are lead to the likelihood, the increased likelihood of certain individuals coming from disruptive families, sexual abuse, etc., that are likely to lead to someone being in that circumstance. We're in the same situation here, but it's, I think we're only getting to the edge of really dawning awareness of the degree of complexity. And as I was making, speaking in Utrecht, we're at the point now where we have so much complexity, we actually do need more sophisticated theoretical ways of parsing this out and parsimoniously so that people can grab it, formulating models of what's going on. And 
we haven't had any new real models of radicalization in the last few years that have, I, I haven't read Sophia's last book, so I have to look over and be very careful. So I didn't read the, the last book that she wrote dealing with this. But from my, to my mind, we still are not at that point where we have models that are adequately grasping what's going on here. Um, and I, I talked in Utrecht about issues of mental health and, and how complex that is. I think for time's sake, I better move on here. But there is real problems. This really requires teamwork. This requires knowledge integration. It requires knowledge translation. People coming with different skill sets, different disciplinary backgrounds, et cetera. And in my humble opinion, you know, with like 40 years experience in academia, we underestimate continuously the problems that poses in terms of language differences across disciplines, but also in terms of just the human dynamics of organizing effectively uh, that kind of work, building those kinds of teams, achieving that kind of knowledge integration. Our institutions of learning are not structured despite their language of supporting multidisciplinarity or interdisciplinarity. Really, the institutions are not structured with incentives that uh, effectively uh, reward that, right? And we are in a system, a highly competitive system, where rewards have to be in place. So it's, I think there's really some practical thinking that has to go into how we can restructure uh, institutional frameworks to allow this kind of work to actually happen, as ha does happen in fields like, on issues like social work problems, like other social problems, where you bring together psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, community workers, and you manage to create organizations that have a fair degree of integration and a subject-specific focus. Much harder to achieve with a gaggle of academics, right? To get academics involved. Herding cats. Okay, problem of specificity, and how am I doing time-wise? Am I gone too far? Okay, all right, because <laughs> I mean, once I get talking, I have no notion of, of how time is passing whatsoever. So I, f I find the problem of specificity, this was brought up by Rick yesterday, because uh, Mark Sageman really focuses in on this in his very controversial article on the stagnation of terrorism research. And uh, Clark McCauley, were you, did you write with Clark in the response? All the responses, I think it was Martha Crenshaw, there's a whole series of prominent people responded. I, I agreed with Andrew Silk, I think, did most of the responses I agreed with them and that, no, no, it's totally wrong. There's been remarkable progress and it is incorrect. However, I think he is correct in that key thesis that in terms of tackling that issue, the specificity issue of we create conceptions of what's going on and the interactions of factors that apply to larger numbers of people still than the actual number of people who radicalize. And that's particularly true when we're dealing with the issue of lots of people talk radically, very few people act radically. So you have the larger issue of, of out of a population of second generation Muslims living in uh, European cities, a lot of the factors like the identity tension issues, the integration issues, employment issues, crime issues, whatever, they apply to large swaths of those populations. And so they're not very adequate in explaining why a tiny handful of individuals radicalize. You can get there by showing how they combine in certain sort of perfect storm ways to generate radicalization. But we're still, there's a gap, explanatory gap in terms of getting through to things. I have been arguing, of course, one way to ameliorate that gap is pay more attention to their first person narratives pay more attention to their, especially their discourse or their language about religion and to treat it more seriously. I'm not going to argue the case here because that's what I've argued elsewhere. But um, uh, I've been having a little bit of a conversation with Scott about Olivier Waugh because he used an Olivier Waugh quote in his presentation and I just published an article on Olivier Waugh that Waugh is a good instance of this because he's been so influential in the French context and the wider European context in understanding jihadist terrorism. But other than the odd, random, cherry-picked quote largely derived from media sources, read through his very engaging, intriguing work, but when you press it, it's speculative, speculative, speculative. There is no data. 
He claims he has data, but he never presents any data. And he certainly never presents quotes. And when he does, I swear to God, he's taking them out of context, right? He takes these little cherry-picked quotes. And sometimes, if you can go back to the media source and read it, you discover, well, when you read the whole passage on this individual, it can be interpreted in completely the opposite way he's chosen to interpret it. So we have problems here. We have to be more careful in trying to figure out these things, and it addresses the macro-micro uh, issue. Because when you're dealing with these large macro issues, like let's take an issue like social integration. So you can cite data about you know, unemployment levels, levels of crime, the types of crime, uh, educational levels, etc. which I'll just pause to say, if you actually look at all that data, it's totally, it's not clear. It's all over the map. But it's usually read as being clear. But if you really press it again, you find out it's not clear that there's an integration issue. It's not clear that, that uh, jihadists in Germany have very low levels of education. Oh, but surprise, surprise, jihadists in the United Kingdom, Canada, and the United States have quite high levels of education. So lack of education, really, what does that tell you? It may not be a relevant factor at all. Uh, we've done detailed analysis, very detailed analysis, comparing Australian and Canadian jihadists. Very curious tale, because these are two very, very similar countries. You would think the backgrounds would be very similar. It turns out that jihadists, even in Australia and Canada, are different. Education is a key factor. The majority of Canadian jihadists have university education. A tiny minority of Australian jihadists have university education. So in dealing with these things, we need to connect. If integration might be a problem, well, how about we just talk to the jihadists and feel how they feel? Was it a problem for you? Uh, I'll give you an instance. When we talked to jihadists, we constantly brought up issues of discrimination. The foreign fighters we talked to, with the exception of about three individuals, said, I never experienced any discrimination. Not an issue. That's not why I radicalized. It had nothing to do with the fact that somebody... And the, of the three that said that they experienced discrimination, the most vocal one about discrimination was a white convert to Islam from Australia. So it's not racism in a classic sense, right? So, but you, you must anchor, attempt, it's not definitive, right? A handful of interviews or 20 interviews or 50 interviews does not prove anything about the macro factor. But at least it starts to make a real linkage between these things, right? With which you could hopefully develop and press things further. Um, yeah, so I've already talked about the general and the, and the talk to action problem. Uh, okay, I think I basically covered most of the issues there. So coming to the conclusions, as I say, it's, it's a bit general at this point. It's that, you know, as I've already said, what we really need to do is get heightened sensitivity that you need to be aware, as Rick said, we need to be more aware of what our explanans is, what precisely is it you're trying to explain? What is your unit of analysis, which is what sociology how calls it? Are you dealing with social structural considerations, group dynamics, individual dynamics? And then as I was making comments yesterday, in fact, if you really press these issues, you understand they are not separate. They're all you know, dynamically interrelated. If you go into the theories that focus at these different levels of analysis, they themselves logically lead to the theories at the other levels of analysis. But often, that's not what they're trying to demonstrate. They're trying to demonstrate the power of their particular perspective. So again, you have to read between the lines and you discover, if you're taking a rational choice perspective, it logically leads to a social identity perspective. They are not actually in opposition, they are complementary. But it takes, right now they're constantly presented as if they were opposed points of views. So we need to be aware of it. We need to really get more data. I want to just sound like that woman yesterday from Connect. She really went on a real, she was very, very articulate. She was extremely well informed. I was, she talked a mile a minute, but I was amazed at the amount of information she had in her hands. And she just said, oh, but we need more, more, more. They were acquiring quite a bit of unique data, but we really need more of that primary data. That means we have to get over this kind of institution of failure of nerve and figure out ways how to uh, allow people to acquire that data without jeopardizing their security. But the security concerns are exaggerated. 
uh, by research ethics boards. Um, and then, yeah, this is the last point. I've already dwelled on this a bit. There are ways we can develop a better appreciation of how to deal with first-person accounts. And I know some people here are going to be still talking about that even today. And, you know, um, we tend to have a bit of a naive approach at present. And it is reflects a lot of what is called mirroring. We interpret other people in line of how we interpret ourselves. We do need a little more skill and systematic skill and theoretical understanding of how to exercise our imagination, our sociological imagination, etc. Step outside of ourselves and realistically understand someone's truly alternative reality. I, and really nothing but experience, you can, you teach that to a degree, but part of it just comes from experience. And I did, when I did my postdoctoral fellowship, I purposely went and worked with one of the leading sociological ethnographers in uh, Canada at the time, really in North America at the time, Bob Proust. And, uh, you know, it was really simple what he taught me. You know, he taught me ways of sitting and very, very patiently listening for a long time, how to use certain questions to guide a person through to deeper experience, right? I suppose in clinical psychology, they get training in this, right? But we need more training in, in general. And I watched him do it, then I did it myself. And we published a little, little article called Shop Till You Drop. It was on consumer behavior. It sounds silly, right? It was about how people's identities are related to their consumer behavior. I regret to say that's probably the second most cited article that I ever published. That thing gets cited like crazy because people love the idea that suddenly you discover grocery shopping isn't just grocery shopping. The different people have completely different ways of conceiving what's going on when they do grocery shopping and that it's related to their self-concept, right? Especially gender. There's huge differences in gender issues in terms of just shopping behavior. But I, I learned by doing that, by interviewing about 60 consumers, by, it's a hard one to get going on. So, oh, what are your shopping preferences? I mean, I thought, how am I going to do this? But he did show me how you could take a few little statements and sympathetically lead the person on, tell, of course, they were making statements of discovery. They were discovering, oh, I hadn't really thought about why I did that, but you know, like my aunt used to so-and-so, and those things turned out to be really important. And so it's a simple thing, but it's something that I, I think warrants some sort of advocacy in this context. And then, as I said, I think in the end I've found over and over again that the specificity issue is the one to constantly keep in mind. It's the regulatory ideal. Every time you do anything in this field, you stop and say, okay, did that help us to better explain, in specific terms, why those tiny handful of people decided to engage in extreme violence? And most of the time when you ask that question of your own work, you'll say, eh, a bit, <laughs> but I'm still falling way short. But that's fine. If you can actually document how you've advanced the knowledge a bit, I think that's a real plus. But I think it would be very helpful if we more often said that, if our conclusions actually were a little bit more in a unanimous way targeting that as an issue and saying, here's how I've contributed on that front. If you were doing articles on schizophrenia, they might, of course, the you know, detailed articles will be about you know, uh, uh, brain issues and chemistry, et cetera. But if you read the more general literature, you know, in the, in the like, current psychology or places where they're trying to just sort of talk to a wider audience, they would be much more focused about, oh, we've got all this great research, but does it actually, because they're able to say, does it help with the treatment of schizophrenics? And yes, we talk about does it help with preventing violent extremism, but I think that becomes very vague and that CVE, PVE is, is a mishmash too. If we instead say, does it help us with that specificity issue, I think we open up the possibilities for more of that dialogue and connection across disciplines and across different types of studies. So thank you very much. <laughs>